Hey everybody, this is Billy Martin from 60 Seconds on Officiating. Then we take a few minutes now, hopefully you've downloaded the pregame discussion card and you might have questions like, hey, it just looks like a bunch of bullet points. You know, what are we really supposed to talk about in a pregame discussion? So I thought I'd take a few minutes and just kind of record something here and kind of walk you through typically what I do and how I use this type of tool in a pregame discussion. Now, of course, you make those adjustments between a two and a three person game. But you can use the same type of discussion points and make those adjustments uh, as you are, depending on what type of crew you're in. Now, I've, I'd like to use a whiteboard that has uh, the ability to use a dry erase marker. Some folks use a little magnetic boards where they can move the little officials around. Or you can use a card and just point to it or write on it, uh, whatever you see fit. But I think it's important that you have two things, that you have one, a very consistent method of uh, discussion points that you walk through and it doesn't have to take long you know it could be five ten minutes but as long as you kind of hit these key points before you go out on the court then you have some type of something visual that you can kind of work through as a crew and kind of actually show those areas of primary coverage and line coverages and positioning etc so let's kind of walk through this here real quick so I always start with game management, and we always talk about pregame on the court. So what are what are the um, things we talk about? And I, one of the things I always like to discuss is, okay, we're going to be on the court 15 minutes prior to the start of the game. This is for an NFHS contest. And in a two-person game, we'll have the referee will observe the visiting team, and the umpire will observe the home team. Now, in a three-person game, it's opposite. We'll have the referee will you know, I'll stand in the, in the division line and we'll have uh, U1 will take the home team and U2 will take the visitors. And I always like to discuss that at some point in time, we're going to go check the books. So as a referee, I mentioned to my crew that I will check at that at, you know, right, uh, right at the 10 minute mark. And as soon as I'm done verifying that the books are ready to go, let's get the captain. So as soon as I turn around, I like to get the captains, but hey, your crew and you as a referee might like to get them at a different time. That's something you can determine in your pregame discussion. And in New Jersey, we actually have a, a little disclosure. We have to talk with the coaches and we bring them out and, and have a couple uh, words with them with the captains. But um, we do that and then uh, we dismiss them and, and we move on. And that, that is our pregame discussion with the coaches and captains. So we talk about the jump ball. So now we're kind of getting into the game situation. In a two-person crew, it's always important to mention that since there's only two of you there, that the referee is going to toss the ball and the U1 or the other umpire is going to chop. You're the only person with the whistle. So you need to blow it dead if it's a bad toss. In a three-person game, the U1 is on the table side. And even though you have, you know, you got two other officials with the whistle in their mouth during the toss, I always like to say, hey, guys, you're not going to hurt my feelings if it's a bad toss and we, we throw it again. What you will do is you'll hurt my feelings if it's a bad toss and we start the game in an ugly mode. So... The initial few conversations that we have around pregame books, captains and coaches, and the jump ball is just getting the game off to a really, really good start. Now we transition the conversation into our primary coverage areas. So let's look at this in two different aspects. What do we talk about when we're in a two-person game versus a three-person game? So one of the first things I'd like to talk about using the whiteboard are primary coverage areas. So here we have a two-person and three-person game board in front of us, so let's talk about each one separately. So primary coverage area, it's certainly worth reviewing, especially officials that are going back and forth between two- and three-person games, is just talk about your primary coverage area. So in a two-person game, just like to say, just remind ourselves that the lead official has the rectangle. Keep the head down, stay in that box, and make sure you're refereeing all that area. The trail can take all this stuff down here, dribble drives to the basket. Always like to say as a as a uh, kind of point of reference that, hey, if you're the trail official or an outside official and you see a travel violation in the paint, then definitely take it. You know, come in and take it hard and take any of these fouls that are coming down here from your primary coverage area. Don't forget you have all this area over here to cover. And we'll talk about this line here a little bit. But basically, you have the trail, and a two-person game has such a big area. You want to make sure that you're very active, kind of working hard and, and working that arc and staying off the sideline, staying, staying away from the division line, and, and working hard. The lead has such a small area. Be very patient down here and let the play come to you. And we talk about a three-person crew. 
obviously much different primary coverage areas. I always draw a little split in the lane, point out that it's such a small area that the lead has in a three-person crew, and remind ourselves as a crew, especially again if we're jumping back and forth between two and three-person games throughout the season, that the trail official has that shooter all the way down into the corner here, right? And the C has anything, especially starting in their area, that's that's working its way into the into the lane. So the lead has a, such a very small area here. And I always like to point out, let's make sure that our center official is working hard to take those plays on their side of the basket line and that the trail is staying with those shooters that are going down in the corner. And the lead has such a very, very small area here. So one of the things I always like to talk about are line responsibilities. So we're talking about a two-person game here. We're looking on the left side of this basketball diagram that, um, of course, we always like to say that the trail has, you know, their sideline, has the division line, and has all the lines in the backcourt. And uh, the lead has their end line and has the sideline to their, to their side, either left or right. Now, the one piece of this, when we talk about line coverage in a two-person game, I think it's really important to talk about in a pregame is the free throw line extended and above. This is a dual line of responsibility. So, you know, either official can call this line above the free throw line extended. So the, the, the lead primarily has that line all the way up. However, I always like to say, you know, if we're in a press situa pressing situation or pressure situation in the, in the front court and the trail official comes over toward the, toward the basket line and is taking a look at that play, Sometimes a trail might even come in the backcourt to get a good look at that play. Instead of having two officials peering up at that play, let's just make sure we have one person looking at that, that line above the free throw line extended, and the lead can now look inside, make sure there's no banging going on there, and the trail can actually cover that. And if the ball happens to go out on that line when the trail is over covering that, then the trail will administer that line. I always like to say if you blow the whistle in the front court that's your line. So if you're over there covering that and that's a dual line of responsibility, make sure you're right on top of it, you blow it, and we don't have two people looking at that one piece of the line. So let's look at the three-person spot. So same thing, we have line responsibilities, a little bit easier because we have three, three folks on the court. So we have sideline, end line, sideline, trail has all the lines in the backcourt. But of course we have this, this line right here, right? So that's our trouble spot in a three-man game. Just like this is, can be a trouble spot in a two-person game as well. That's the line sometimes you need to give the lead a little bit of help on. So you like to say in a pregame, you know, if the ball goes out of bounds on this line as a lead, if you are not sure, you know, of, of who it went out on, just blow the whistle, stop the clock, raise your hand, and let's get some eye contact and walk toward each other. And as the C in a three-person game, or as a trail in a two-person game, we'll come down and give you some help on that. So just stop the clock, and we'll come together. If you're not sure, and both of us are not sure, then we will, we will go to the arrow on that play. So from a line coverage perspective, you know, we of course have in a three-person game, we also have the, uh, the C who can help on any deflected balls that happen to go into the, into the backcourt. So always be ready for those types of plays. Now when we talk about three-point shot coverage. So now we're just working our way down the checklist here. And three-point shot coverage in a two-person game, you know, you have that three-point arc that goes all the way across to the free throw line extended. One of the things I always like to say in a, in a two-person game in our pregame discussion is, you know, let's let the let the trail take a better look at that. You know, we talk about this kind of gray area over here, you know, that's right, you know, because it's, it's sometimes hard to see, but the trail has such a better look at that play than the lead does. Let the lead focus on all the banging that's going on in the paint, and the trail has that, that shooter over here. Let's just not have two folks with the three-point signal going up so we have two two officials watching a shooter and no one watching off the ball. And that goes the same thing in a three-person game. In our pregame discussion, I always like to say, since the trail has it over a little bit further here, okay, the, the, the C has much smaller three-point arc, but, you know, we have that kind of gray area in the middle here. Always like to say in a pregame, 
if you are the official that, you know, if it's kind of in this gray area, you know, let the trail take that and let's let the C work back inside. We always want the C kind of focusing more inside than outside. So give it up to the trail. If you have for some reason that the trail doesn't put the three point signal up, certainly you can take that. But we don't want two folks from the outside looking at our shooters. So whoever gets that hand up first in that gray area, let's let the other person make sure that we're focusing on the inside. So we're not having two officials focusing on the shooter and no one looking off the ball. Now let's talk a little bit about matchups and strong side. So in a two person game, Typically, you have, you know, you're going to stay in your spots. Uh, you're not going to rotate during a live ball. But you can, if you have a particular matchup on this side, we'd like to say that the lead can come over and take a look at that play and kind of rotate over to get a better look at that strong side, especially if you have a lot of players on this side. But in a pregame, you should always say, if I do that, if, or if the lead does that, they could come over. When, they, when the ball transitions back up court, they're not going to come up this side. They are going to come up, go back that other side, the side that they originally started on. And they never give up this line. So they're always going to be cognizant of the fact that even though that you come over here to cover this strong side play, you're not going to give up that line as the lead that you're going to make sure that you cover all your lines and you're coming over to help out on this type of strong side area. Now, if we talk about on a three-person crew on matchups and strong side, different story. So we want a very active lead, right? That We want the lead to be going back and forth based on the way the play dictates the coverage that's needed for the crew. So one of the things that I talk about in a pregame is that, you know, let's not, let's not be lead in our feet here and solid to the ground. Let's, let's stay, stay active. And we should never have a situation where the C is overloaded with too many folks. Now, if there's just a single matchup where maybe there's there's an offensive player and a defensive player in front of them, a single matchup, okay, and especially if the ball's moving around a lot. But if we got a bunch of players over here, let's get the lead over to this side and start our rotation so that the so that the trail can be drawn down and the C can now drop back into a new trail position. So that we always have two people on the ball side. The other thing I like to talk about is that when the ball is transitioning in a three-person game from the back court to the front court, the, of course the trail has the 10-second count. And let's say they start to dribble this way toward the C side. I always like to say, you know, as a C, let's focus on the inside. Let's look inside because the trail's got the 10-second count, and until that dribbler picks up the ball, stay with that count even if they might come over a little bit you know little you know out of their area just stay with that count until they pick up their dribble at that point in time when that first dribble is picked up in the front court now it's now it's a decision time so if it is right here it's a single matchup c can just you know you have that matchup real nice if maybe they come over into this area back here the C now can decide, should I come back here? If so, if it's a high pressure, they might come back, take a look at it. That's going to start our rotation, and that's going to get everybody moving based on, on the situation. So again, what we like to say is let's referee matchups, whether we're in a two-person game or a three-person game. Let's get our officials moving. We always like to have two officials on that strong side refereeing those matchups so that the, the opposite official, which is the C or center, can work offside rebounding. So talk about off ball and rebounds. So in a two person game, typically the trail official is going to take all that weak side rebounding stuff. And again, you only have two people out there, so any official can take that. But let's make sure that the trail is looking for those types of things and aggressive from the trail coming in and get, getting those. In a three-person game, you have both the trail and the C that can look at that. But, you know, the C should definitely keep an eye on all this weak side rebounding stuff and, and be very active and come in and take those plays. So we talk about press coverage. In a two-person game, it's easy. As the new lead that's transitioning down the floor, if there is a press in the backcourt, four or more back there, you need to drift, stay back here. Don't be so quick to run down the floor. You need to stay back and help your partner, which is the new trail, transition up the court, and you need to help in any type of matchups that are going on in the backcourt. 
In a three-person game, it's much easier because the basket goes in, the, 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 the trail is now going to transition down to become the new lead. It is a very lazy C. You, need, you don't really need to go anywhere. Just kind of sit still for a second and see what type of defense is being set up because you have plenty of time to make that small transition down the floor. But stay there. If you have four or more players in the backcourt, let's make sure that we have the C and the trail officiating in the backcourt. And you're going to help the, the uh, trail because the trail is going to have that, the dribbler, uh, and, and the initial defender, but any type of quick throw off of that, you're going to look across the floor and you're going to see that first pass and you're going to take any type of fouls or contacts or illegal plays that happen beyond that first matchup. So again, helping out on the press, let's not make sure we're just running down the floor, talk about in a pregame how you're going to help each other as a crew, any type there's a press situation. I always talk about asking for help. Because it's really important. We talked about that a little bit earlier where you have these little areas of coverage where there might be a little bit of trouble, where you can always ask for a little bit of help. But anytime we have a situation where something goes out of bounds or we might have a play that's kind of weird and you're not sure, just blow your whistle, raise your hand, and ask for help. We'll come in, we'll talk about it, and then you as the calling official will make that final determination. If for some reason... I always say in a pregame, hey, if I make a call and I'm the only one in the gym that saw this ball go out of bounds and I said it was white ball and everyone knew it was it was blue, then blow your whistle, come in and talk about it, and I will change my call if you have information provided that would be, you know, make me change that call. And and I'm not uh, embarrassed by it. Let's just make sure that we get the call right. But Let's come together and talk about that. So at any time, we can ask for help or you can offer help, and then we'll decide on which way is the best way to go. So I talk about free throws and bonus. So it's important, I always say in a pregame, hey, if we, whether it's a two-person or a three-person game, if we have free throw situations where guys are stepping in early, they're not waiting till the ball hits the ring on a free throw. Let's nip that in the bud. Let's get that early. We don't want to make that first call in the closing minute or two of the game. Let's get that early. And let's make sure that we are looking to see when the the teams are ready for the bonus because we always want to make sure that our off official is identifying our shooters for us. So let's be cognizant of guys stepping in early. Let's be cognizant of when we're coming up to the bonus, whether it's a one-on-one or whether we're in the double bonus. The other thing I like to talk about is the AP arrow. So whether it's a two-person or three-person game, you're always going to have someone that's opposite the table. So whenever we have a change in AP arrow status, let's make sure we have at least one of the officials looking over there to make sure that arrow has changed. If they haven't changed, don't panic. We don't need to stop a live ball, but as soon as the ball becomes dead, Let's stop, blow our whistle, and let's go over and fix that arrow. So somebody should be looking at it. Typically, it's a person that's opposite the table. But hey, the more of us that look at it, the better it's going to be. Let's be very cognizant. Anytime that AP arrow switches, let's have at least one official look at it, if not two. Timeouts and substitutions. This is a big one. So in a two-person game, if you are calling a timeout, we would like to say call it, go over to the table, administer it, and then come right back, okay, and mark your spot. And our other official is going to be in our 30-second position or in our our 60-second position. So what we don't want to do is have a lot of flip-flopping and bouncing, you know, switching during a dead ball. Let's, I like to say, let's do it by the book. You call it, you administer it. The other official who's at the division line will say the division line. Of course, that's in a two-person game. In a three-person game, it's the same thing, though. If you call it, you administer it. And our official that's furthest away is going to go down at the top of the key for a 30-second timeout or is going to go to the opposite block for a 60-second timeout. And same thing here, 30s, 60s. And if you've called the timeout, you come and administer it and go right back to spot the ball. And with our timeouts it's really important especially in a three-person game where you have you have two folks that can go in go into the huddles and get them out of the huddles so they're in their huddles go in give them that first first horn warning and then 
let them know, you know, if that second horn goes, we're going to put the ball down. You don't need to stay in there and babysit, but just, hey, give them that warning. We're ready to go. Come back out, get in your position, and we're going to put the ball down and get ready to go and play. And I always like to say to my crew, hey, if you're still in the huddle there, I know you're still working to get them out, but don't hang around there forever. When you're done, get out of there. And as soon as you get back in position, if that team is still really lollygagging to get out there, we're going to put the ball down and get moving, you know, per the rules. And we talk about substitutions. So in a two-person game, it's always opposite the table that will handle substitutions because you have a better look at the table. Let's say the table's over here. You have a better look at it. Now, in a three-person game, it's a little bit different because you have someone that's table side. They're much closer to the table. So in a three-person game, I would like to say, let's make sure that we have our person that's closest to the table will handle those substitutions. And let's make sure that we count, whether it's coming out of a timeout or coming out of a substitution, let's make sure... If you're handling the huddles during a timeout, you count your players coming out. If you're handling a substitution, table side or opposite the table, you count those players. Not to say that everybody shouldn't be counting, but let's make sure the person that's handling those huddles or handling those substitutions is for sure getting a count. When we talk about halftime and end of game, so at halftime, I like to tell my crew that let's meet across the ta- away from the table um, over here, and let's wait till the coaches and teams clear the bench area. Don't like to go over and be ambushed at the table at halftime. So we'll wait till everybody clears. And, you know, if the coaches hang out there, we'll just wait. It's not a big deal. We'll wait till they clear, get whatever information they need from the table. We'll go over there. At the end of the game, different story. We're not going to hang around on the court. You know, we're going to visually look over and make sure the scores table is fine. But at the end of the game, you know, if, if, if this is where the exit is, we're going we're gonna to head for the exits at the end of the game. Let's don't worry about the ball. Let's not worry about the coaches. Let's just get off the court at the end of the game. So halftime, we have a meeting spot. At the end of the game, we have a plan that we are going out the door as soon as we uh, just give a visual check to the, to the scores table. And now we kind of go through these just points of emphasis really quick. And this is a great opportunity for your partners to kind of chime in with different ideas. So just talk about if there's any particular rule changes for this particular season. Might go through a couple of those, whether it has to do with um, even some points of emphasis around the rules. Um, Are there any special signals that we might use as a crew? The one that I always talk about is, hey, two, you know, one is if I am... Uh, going to stop you from inbounding the ball because we have some substitutions. I'm going to hold two hands up. I'm going to hold two hands. I'm going to my whistle. Put my two hands up in the air. That means do not inbound that ball. And when I'm ready to go, I'm going to either point to you or I'm going to just give you a little kind of thumbs up. That's one of my special signals. The other one is uh, kind of end of quarter. And if if it's if it's my clock that I'm I'm opposite the table in a three man game or I'm in the trail in a two person game then I'm just going to kind of give a little point upwards to let you know that I have the last second shot. So they're kind of special signals. Partner communication, always like to talk about that it's really important we have great eye contact. So let's focus on great communication throughout the entire game. One type of communication um, we want to make sure that we have if, if there's any type of problems. So if we, especially if we have double whistles, let's make sure we have really, really good eye contact on that. We talk about throwing spots and it's, you know, let's make sure we put the ball in play where it's supposed to be put in play. So as a, a good official, I'm going to point to the spot, whether it's a, a, a after a foul or whether it's on an inbounds play, I'm going to point to that spot. Let's make sure we spot it in the right spot. Talk about DQ players as well. So, you know, in a two-person game, if you have a fifth foul and you've reported the foul, then you are going to go to the opposite position because you're going to switch. Let's have the other official will handle that disqualified player. So it's a little tougher in a two-person game because there are obviously only two of you there. Three-person game, it's great. So in New Jersey, we report uh, to the table and then we go back opposite again. And it's great because we have someone at table side that can actually handle that situation. Let's talk about huddles and horns. I think we mentioned it a little bit earlier, but it's certainly worth repeating. Again, just a reminder, huddles, let's make sure we have, in a three-person game, we have two officials, you know, going in, one in each huddle, and giving them that first horn warning, and that warning should include, we're not going to accept substitutes, so it could be, you know, first horn, no subs, 
and then we're coming out of there. We're going to get the ball in play to go if they're not ready to go. And as far as a two-person game, since you only have one off official, you might have to help each other on that. But, hey, that off official can handle both of those huddles. But just make sure we're getting them out of there and kind of just getting ready to play if they're going to, if they're going to sit around and not, not get going. Certainly worth mentioning the coaching box. So one of the things we like to look at is, hey, is there a coaching box? And we'll look at that pregame, make sure that that coaching box is down. And uh, just you know, you can't hurt to, to remind the crew, let's make sure that the coaches are staying within the confines of the, of the coaching box. And if not, you know, we're going to take care of business. Double whistles. One of the things we always like to say, especially in a three-person game, is that we don't want preliminary signals on a double whistle from the outside. And we talk about double whistles. We do like to talk about, especially in a three-person game, where potentially you could have a double whistle between between the center official and the lead. So I always like to say in a three-person game, you know, let's let the C work really hard, especially when we have a dribble drive to the basket that's coming from the C side. So we have a we have a dribbler that's starting here, and all of a sudden we have a common foul as the player's going to the basket. So that's a great call for the C to have. If we have a double whistle on that, and the lead sees it, you know, because it's happening right in the basket area here, the lead has it, the C has it, let's just give it up to the C. Start it on the C side. That's a great play. It shows everyone that the C's working really hard, and that truly is their call. If we have a, a, a like a train wreck here in the lane, and we have a double whistle, especially if the play came straight down the chute here, we have a double whistle, no preliminaries from the outside, but let's give that one up to the lead. So we have that train wreck, or especially if we have a secondary defender down here in the lane, we'll give those up to the lead. Key is on a double whistle, we always like to talk about let's not have preliminary signals on any type of double whistle from the outside because we're not sure if we both have the same call and let's decide who should take that call. So if it's coming from the C side, let's have the C take it. If it's coming down the middle and it's in the basket area, we'll give it up to the lead. If it's coming from the trails area into the leads area, we'll let the trail take that. In a two-person game, same type of thing. If it's coming from the trails area and goes into into the into the paint here, then hey, who's ever got a best shot? There's just no preliminary signals from the outside, and we'll give it up to the lead. So a lot of communication. That's the one of the hardest things is double whistles to use your eyes and just make sure that we're looking at each other and not being so premature that we're giving you know one person's given a block, one person's given a, the uh, uh, charge player control signal. And we talk about goaltending and basket interference. So in a, in a two-person game, m most of the time, it's going to be the trail official. Now, if the lead official has not buttoned hooked around into their position yet on a fast break, and they see a play up around the rim as they're still coming down the court, yes, that's a great time for that lead official to take that basket interference or goaltending play but once the lead official has has kind of button hooked around is now facing this way and it's going to be all trail on a three-person crew it's probably great to say look if i have a shooter in the corner here i'm not really going to be able to see up around the rim so make sure that the off official is looking at all that play that's happening up around the rim and it's the same thing if the if if the trail has something in the corner, that the the, the center official is looking at all the, the stuff that's happening around the the rim area. And of course the lead has no responsibility on that at all. So we talk about last second shots in a two person game, always the trail. In a three person game, it's always the person that's opposite the table. That could be the center official or that could be the trail. If we have a situation toward the end of the game where it's really close and we want to get together as a crew, let's do that. Let's make sure we get together. We're going to talk about who has that last second shot. And if we have any uh, situations where there's any, any questions, we'll come together and talk about it. But let's be real clear on who's going to take that last second shot so we don't have two officials that are making some type of ruling on a last second play. One of the things I always like to talk about are technical fouls. As a point of emphasis, if we have a technical foul, whether it's a two-person or three-person crew, 
if you're going to call Technic Fell, that's great. But let's come together as a crew and just have a quick five second discussion on what you have and make sure that the crew is ready to go and walk to the proper end and administer that technical foul properly so that it's there's nothing more embarrassing than walking to the wrong end and getting things all messed up so i like to say hey if we have a tea you know call it let's come together before you actually go over to the table and then if you are the calling official you're going to go to the table and report it and then you're going to the division line and as the off official or the other two officials in a three-person crew we'll go to the right end make sure we shoot that properly and you'll be at the division line ready to start our play always touch on injuries and fighting so if we have an injury let's make sure we deal with that if we have blood make sure we uh, ask that player to um, it's going to need to leave the game if we have a fighting situation let's just make sure that we're very cognizant obviously we're trying to prevent those situations but let's make sure that we get a, gr a good visual on any players that are participating in any type of situation that's fighting and we see any players that might come off the bench and I always leave it open at the end here for unique situations for, you know, have you seen anything this year that you'd like to talk about as a crew? Was there some crazy plays? You know, that's, I think that's a great way to wrap up your pregame discussion is just talking about anything weird that you've might seen. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this and can take away some pearls of wisdom out of this. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to run through all these every game. But I think a methodical approach to a pregame discussion should include some type of bullet points that you would touch on each and every time and some type of visual diagram that you can work with your crew and kind of, you know, maybe either whether you're drawing diagrams or moving pennies on a piece of paper or a mag magnetic board always works out great. So we're hopefully this will help you become a better official and especially when you are the referee in charge, take control of that pregame spark that conversation with your crew, get into a nice dialogue, even if you only have a few minutes, just to prepare before that game. So good luck.